For our next session, we'd like to welcome SECT fellow, Dr. Patrick Donnelly. Dr. Donnelly is the Director of Cardiovascular Imaging at Ulster Hospital and a senior lecturer at Queen's University in Belfast. Today, Dr. Donnelly is going to discuss his experience with utilizing cardiac CT in his clinical workflow for coronary artery disease and structural heart cases. Welcome, Dr. Donnelly. Thank you, Ty, and thank you to SECT, G, and Araneta for giving me the opportunity to discuss my experience over the last three years with the, the cardiograph CT scanner in contemporary clinical practice. Today's title is The Role of Cardiac CT and How It Fits into Clinical Practice of the, of the Heart Team. I was struck just the other day when I read a, an article in a, a local broadsheet paper that really articulated the challenge that we face over the course of the next 25 years. Um, the, the title was 45 billion nightmare. And whenever you read into it, it's really talking about the prevalence of obesity and the tsunami of heart disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, that we here in the United Kingdom who have a, a public a health sector are, are going to face if we don't start to uh, meet the challenge. In some respects in cardiology practice, we've got very good at treating patients who have advanced disease. In fact, our outcomes are never better and our morbidity and mortality has never been lower. Uh, but the prevalence of disease is rising at such a rate that modern healthcare systems is really going to struggle with the challenge of trying to focus a finite resource uh, to the many individuals who are going to be affected. And yet we really don't need a lot of fancy technology um, and fancy medication to make a big difference to the vast majority of our patients. The American Heart Association has the Life Simple 7 um, uh, advisory, and it's very straightforward for, for anyone really to, to do, for, for patients or individuals to pop along and have an assessment that identifies the key cardiovascular risk factors that contribute to the development of coronary artery disease. So that's really would be a very low cost intervention if we were able to advance a prevention program. But sadly, we know that our reach uh, into the community and our ability to empower individuals to change uh, life behaviours whenever they don't yet have an awareness of an illness that affects their quality of life is very challenging. So it's very easy for us, certainly within the cardiology community, to still consider that detection is really about detecting patients with advanced illnesses who are likely to require uh, our intervention, either in a hospital setting or in an outpatient setting. I, I recently put early detection of coronary artery disease into a, a browser, and this is what it came up with. Um, early detection of cardiovascular disease was really about informing patients about the severe crushing central chest pain that they're likely to experience as they're having their first myocardial infarction. Really, is that what we think is appropriate a contemporary clinical practice? Certainly, I think it was a reasonable expectation uh, to identify those in, to identify those symptoms that could herald a myocardial infarction and uh, allow the patient to present early for evaluation in a cardiology uh, clinic or hospital ward uh, and undergo successful revascularization. It was also appropriate at a time when in the ex vivo imaging of coronary artery disease was the only way that we could really evaluate uh, preclinical coronary atherosclerosis. But I don't think in 2021 that this is still the case. And I think we should be setting the bar higher um, for ourselves as cardiologists uh, when we uh, are talking to and evaluating the risk of our patients. A lot of our services currently are focused on the assessment of patients with chest pain, preferably chest pain that is subacute or, or chronic um, rather than chest pain that's presenting to us in the community as a cardiac arrest or by ambulance through our emergency departments. For those more elective patients, we have had a two-step process for over 25 years. Normally, these patients would be evaluated by the clinical team. 
They would undergo a non-invasive imaging test and subsequently have an invasive catheter coronary angiogram performed if that non-invasive imaging test uh, suggested um, that uh, there was some abnormal features, perhaps indicative of coronary artery disease. And yet, despite uh, really uh, robust uh, pathways and high standards of clinical reporting, these test characteristics are not sufficient for us to act uh, as a, a good gatekeeper for invasive catheter coronary angiography resource. In fact, in the United States, we know that up to 50% of all invasive coronary angiograms are performed without the need for subsequent percutaneous revascularization or indeed coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So there's something fundamentally wrong at the heart of our current approach, which has been approach that's largely been used to detect myocardial ischemia. And with all these different methods and these variant test characteristics, we know that in patients with multi-vessel significant coronary artery disease, we will be able to detect um, perfusion abnormalities, ECG abnormalities, regional wall motion abnormalities on our imaging technology. But you will note I said advanced. And we know that coronary artery disease will be progressing in our individual subjects some 15, 20 years at least before they present with metabolic disturbance, perfusion abnormality, regional wall motion abnormality, or ECG change. So we're really only capturing these patients uh, after the horse is bolted in terms of their coronary artery disease development. So should we be holding fast to our early detection of ischemia strategy? I think not. Because in reality, this is an early revascularization strategy. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with the assessment of those patients at risk of having coronary artery disease. And in fact, we know from large multi-center studies over many years now that revascularization doesn't really change hard cardiovascular outcomes such as uh, morbidity or mortality or myocardial infarction rate associated with the presence of disease. So perhaps we're really chasing the wrong thing whenever we're chasing who would benefit from access to a limited resource, namely cath lab and revascularization. And perhaps a bigger bang for our buck will be best uh, focused towards identifying those patients who have coronary artery disease, both preclinical and clinical. There can be no doubt that the recent uh, studies of ischemia uh, and, of course, the Scott Hart study has really helped shift our opinion as to what we could be potentially achieving for our patients if we had access to cardiac CT technology. In David Newby Group's study, comparing standard of care, normally treadmill testing or some form of imaging test versus a CT first strategy, there were substantial differences in outcome for our patients who were identified as having coronary artery disease by CT. And with that, there seemed to be an increase in compliance over time with life-saving, uh, risk-changing, uh, cardiac medication. One of the challenges for us within the cardiothoracic radiology community and also within the cardiology community is really having the confidence that the CT technology is fit for purpose for the evaluation of our, pa of our patients. And while cardiac CT imaging is extremely challenging, we've got a moving structure, sometimes a very fast moving structure. We have sub-millimeter coronary artery vessels that sit on top of the heart, moving constantly. And we have the vagaries of uh, image acquisition, whether that is contrast enhancement, breath hold, or uh, heartbeat acquisition. For the majority of patients on 64, 128 type scanners, um, it requires several heartbeats stitched together to evaluate the coronary arteries. And with that comes some inbuilt um, opportunities for reconstruction issues that could lead to um, false calls or concerns by clinicians who are evaluating the CT data set. 
On the other hand, over the last 12 uh, years, we have noticed unprecedented advances in uh, premium CT scanners that are able to evaluate in, in superb detail every organ of the body. But with that, there has become increasing demand from multiple other subspecialties, all with non-moving structures to get access to our CT scan technology. So we find this particularly challenging for us here in a busy District General Hospital in Northern Ireland, where we just ran occasional CT sessions. And with that, we had to rationalize access and with that, drive a potential inequity to our care delivery model. So that's where we became interested several years ago in the development by Araneta and GE of the cardiograph scanner. It's the first bespoke cardiac CT scanner of its type. It seems to uh, absolve us from many of the sins of image acquisition with uh, prior CT technology. It has a very high spatial resolution. It is the highest temporal resolution available with any current existing CT platform. It provides single heartbeat acquisition, um, which limits uh, motion artifact and improves our confidence in our evaluation of our patients. The image and reconstruction algorithms, not least snapshot freeze, remove some of the challenges uh, that we as CT readers are only too aware of, namely that segment two of the right coronary artery where motion artifact is a constant impediment to diagnostic image quality. So who are we? The Ulster Hospital is a district general but university teaching hospital in Belfast. We serve a population of 420,000. We actually have the largest ED emergency department in Northern Ireland and sadly 30% of our patients require admission. We have the highest number of ST elevation myocardial infarctions in our area, not least because of the, the high comorbidity um, uh, and the elderly population that we serve. The cardiograph was installed in 2018, and we now have a five-day-a-week service that's supported by both cardiology and radiology departments. We receive referrals from the Rapid Access Angina Clinic, which is a program set up to evaluate patients with stable chest pain thought to be of cardiac origin. And we uh, try to see these patients within a two week window. And we, we're using the cardiac CT to help us identify those who most need our very scarce uh, nursing and medical resource. Increasingly, particularly over COVID, we have been imaging our emergency department patients this is despite the fact we have a zero and one hour troponin rule out pathway, which is extremely valuable. But we also find a lot of patients will have non-specific STT wave changes or clinical presentation and have very small troponin elevations above the, the 99th centile. So for us in Northern Ireland, that would be a troponin T level greater than 14, but probably less than 50. And in those individuals, having access to CT allowed us to define pathology and to determine the significance of their presentation in terms of coronary artery disease or acute coronary syndrome. And we were able to confidently decide who was going to use our very limited access to the cath lab during COVID. Cardiology ambulatory hub referrals uh, we receive from our ED clinical staff and other medical subspecialties. And increasingly, we're using cardiac CT for our inpatient workup for those patients who have decompensated with their cardiac condition and now merit uh, some form of advanced intervention. Our valve surveillance program, which has been used to monitor patients with valvular heart disease over uh, a time scale of years, uh, we would take uh, automatic referrals for them once those patients are reaching criteria where an intervention um, uh, such as a surgical valve replacement or indeed a, uh, a percutaneous or transcutaneous valve uh, procedure has been anticipated. And increasingly, we are taking referrals from the familial hyperlipidemia clinic and, of course, the erectile dysfunction clinic, where there is some evidence to suggest patients are presenting to those clinics due to underlying cardiovascular disease. I want to share with you just some of our case examples over the last number of weeks and months. Um, so that we can get a better feel of how we're using the cardiograph system, which is a, we're very fortunate to have a dedicated cardiac system um, for the evaluation of our patients. 
So the first individual is a 63-year-old male who presented to a rapid access angina clinic with typical exertional chest pain. Two risk factors, namely hypercholesterolemia and hypertension. Uh, and the pretest probability for this individual, based on a modified Diamond Forrester criteria, was 61%. So definitely an individual worthy of further testing. Traditional pathways would say um, CT or indeed um, uh, functional imaging tests. CT rather eloquently demonstrates the coronary arteries. The right coronary artery here demonstrates atherosclerosis in all three segments with a partially calcified plaque present in the mid-segment. There's further atherosclerosis within the, the proximal LAD and there's a little bit of atheroma evidenced within the proximal left circumflex. Um, when we did this uh, study as part of an evaluation using CTFFR, so we were able to compare our findings with what we found at invasive catheter coronary angiography. So the moderate right coronary artery stenosis seemed mild uh, at best, invasive catheter coronary angiography, a little bit of disease in the LAD wasn't very well identified, nor was the, the minor disease in the left circumflex at invasive catheter coronary angiography. But I suppose, uh, I think uh, I want to just uh, clarify that, that um, the CTFFR results in this particular case confirmed that this patient had no evidence of uh, an ischemic inducing lesion. So where before we would have perhaps performed a functional test followed by an invasive catheter coronary angiogram, we were not able to perform a CT coronary angiogram, identify plaque and totality of plaque burden, the degree of stenosis, and cross-reference that to the level of myocardial ischemia um, that uh, the patient may have been experiencing. So in one test, we were able to avoid that two-test strategy for our patients. And as our experience has grown with the use of heart flow CTFF4, uh, we are now um, very comfortable about the results that we get from heart flow and very often no longer feel the need um, to, to move a patient towards invasive catheter coronary angiography. About 40% of patients that present through our rapid access angina program do not have a significant coronary artery stenosis, but they will have a burden of coronary artery disease. Given that we know that patients with coronary atherosclerosis are at higher risk for hospitalization with myocardial infarction, and indeed they have a higher mortality, I don't think it's uh, fair um, for them, for us to just ignore them because our current strategy is focused towards revascularization. Working with some uh, key opinion leaders in the field and University College London, we have put together the Southeastern Trust Cardiac Prevention Programme, which picks up these patients with mild to moderate coronary atherosclerosis and engages them in a behavioural change lifestyle intervention programme, which we hope, uh, if we follow up over time, will lead to an improvement in their outcomes and less um, likely um, and make it less likely for them to be admitted to our, our, our heart ward for revascularization after myocardial infarction. Traditionally, we have perceived cardiology, uh, uh, cardiac CT, particularly among the cardiology community, as a rule out test. In fact, with software and technology that the cardiograph can give us, it is absolutely a rule in test. Uh, this is the case of a 62-year-old female who described breathlessness. Um, her pretest probability was seven. So based on our current evaluation of these patients, she's female, she's breathless with a pretest probability of seven. Contemporary practice would most likely have suggested that she didn't require any further cardiology evaluation. Yet when we undertook her cardiac CT on the presumption that her chest pain could be an angina equivalence given its onset, we find someone with really quite advanced coronary artery disease. Her right coronary artery has significant lesions in segment one and two with a very critical lesion in segment two. Her LAD has a very significant lesion in uh, the proximal segment. There's further tubular disease in the mid LAD. The ramus intermedius has some osteal disease, but it's a small caliber vessel. And while there was a left AV circumflex, which was small, the lateral wall of the heart was supplied um, by a, a large obtuse marginal branch. And you can see here that there is a long area of significant tubular, a partially calcified plaque disease. When we uh, ran CTFFR, our anatomic 
um, the significant stenosis correlated extremely well with a high burden of myocardial ischemia. So perhaps this was a true angina equivalence. But yet, whenever we take a look at the images beyond the coronary arteries that are identified by cardiac CT, there is a moderate circumferential pericardial effusion. So we've identified not just one potential cause for this lady's breathlessness, but two from a single study. I think if we look at the very exciting early results from the Syntax 3 Revolution trial, there's something to be said for using cardiac CT as a rule-in test to inform our heart team decision-making, particularly when we add CTFFR to it. During COVID, um, we, we started to use CT more often for the evaluation of our uh, patients presenting to ED. This is the case of a 62-year-old male who presented just two weeks after a myocardial infarction with recurrent chest pain that just wasn't settling. He was feeling more breathless than normal. Uh, for the ED team, it was impossible to really assess him as we would do normally, patients presenting with an ACS. His STT wave changes could just be resolving changes after his prior myocardial infarction. His troponin elevation could just be a troponin elevation. Uh, there was just no way of, uh, of knowing. So was this a problem with this patient's medication, their stents, um, or was this just a resolving myocardial infarction? This first image is an image from the cath lab after their successful percutaneous revascularization of the LAD. And these CT images show some plaque within the left main stem, which is non-occlusive, a well-deployed uh, stent within the, the proximal LAD and a good caliber contrast enhanced coronary artery reaching the apex of the left ventricle. So I'm no longer worried about a stent complication uh, having seen these images. On CT, we were able to identify that the anterior, particularly the mid and apical anterior wall was thinned compared to the basal anterior wall. And there was some layering um, um, at the apex of the left ventricle. So the wall, uh, I'm not sure you can truly appreciate this on the projected image, but you can see the, the endocardial wall well and a slightly a different attenuation value um, for a mass or a lesion uh, adjacent to the, the wall. Um, and this was consistent with an apical thrombosis, secondary to a myocardial infarction, which is transmural. When we performed a transthoracic echo using Sonovu, you can see um, this thrombus, but I don't think it's as well depicted as it is on the, the CT examination. So this is a, a case which perfectly it demonstrated the role of CT and patients who are presenting through ED who are really rather complex. And we have to knock down uh, a series of potential differential diagnoses. But again, we're not just using the coronary artery information. We are looking at the cardiac morphology information, and we're also able to assess the non-cardiac uh, structures as well. So as we advance uh, to 2050 with this tsunami of uh, cardiovascular disease uh, coming towards us, how might we use um, technology within our uh, diagnostic pathways to focus a very limited healthcare specialist resource to those patients who are most at need? Well, I think we need to strip it right back to the fact that if you have an imaging technology that gives you unparalleled spatial resolution, is robust in day-to-day -day clinical practice and consistent in giving us information that is beneficial for our clinical decision-making, it seems crazy that we're still having a debate about cardiac CT on the sidelines of contemporary clinical care. Once you have access to this technology, once you utilize it to its full capability, and it becomes an integral part of your cardiovascular assessment pathway. If, for example, we accept that the only coronary artery disease worth knowing about is left main stem or proximal LAD coronary artery disease, I don't know of any other imaging test available that can evaluate the left main stem in more detail 
than a good cardiac CT examination. But it goes beyond that. We have the opportunity when we perform cardiac CT in our chest pain patients to pick up those patients who have early coronary atherosclerosis. And with that, we can really get into a conversation that can engage them around lifestyle behavioral change. We can take a look at targeting those risk factors that are so important in the development of adverse cardiovascular events. But most importantly, rather than taking a generic pill that needs a lot of patients to treat for some sort of benefit, we can target our medication to those patients who are most in need. So this is how the cardiograph has been so influential in perfecting an imperfect science uh, of the management and investigation of patients with cardiovascular disease. Thank you.